So welcome, Kathy. I'm so honored that you could be here with us. And I know that in, in Buddhism, you use the word metta. So I'd like to say much metta to you. Thank you. So to everyone who's watching, this is another episode of uh, Interheart Kuwait. Um, Kathy Merchant is the founder of the Living Interfaith Sanctuary in Vancouver, British Columbia. Living Interfaith Sanctuary is an interfaith congregation whose members comprise a wide variety of religious traditions. Kathy has worked as an interfaith activist, community organizer, and compassionate listening facilitator since 2008. She has a Master of Arts degree in Middle East Studies from the University of Washington, a Master of Divinity degree from the Vancouver School of Theology, and is an ordained interfaith minister who currently serves as the interfaith leader at the Living Interfaith Sanctuary and as the Minister of Community Life at Canadian Memorial United Church. Kathy's faith tradition is Mahayana Buddhism, and her husband and children are all Ismaili Muslims. So Kathy, um, that's a very impressive interfaith resume you have, and we're all very inspired by you. But my question is, what does it mean to be a living interfaith minister? Oh, thank you, it's a very good question. Uh, yes, so I have the same background and kind of credentials as other clergy people. So I went to seminary, I went to the Vancouver School of Theology, um, and I, during that time I also worked in various uh, religious settings, um, and then I got ordained as a minister. So in that way it's kind of, it follows a lot of other um, Jewish and Christian, uh, um, their path. Uh, to being ordained. Um, however, instead of focusing on one particular faith tradition, um, I actually I took classes in all different kinds of faiths. I did many different projects at different kinds of religious institutions. Um, and then when I was ordained, it was with an understanding that I'd be serving an interfaith congregation like I do now. So I had started the Living Interfaith Sanctuary, as you mentioned. Um, our community has people from eight different religious traditions. Um, and then our model is that whichever religion has a holiday that week, that's what we celebrate. So, and we take turns. We try to practice what we call spiritual hospitality. So every religious tradition gets about two services devoted to them a year. So you'll celebrate one of your holidays and then you won't get another service in your own tr tradition for about six months. Um, and then we rotate over the course of the year. Uh, we celebrate more than 10 different faith traditions. And then the people in our community belong to these different faiths. So I have to have enough of an understanding of the different faiths to be able to speak into that. Um, so usually if it's something that's um, a really intense faith matter, then I'll reach out to our connections from other um, faith communities and say, you know, this one of my congregants is struggling with this particular thing. I was wondering if you'd like to talk to them. So to help make sure they can support them in that way. But otherwise I have enough Inshallah, I have enough of an understanding of the different religions uh, that I can help support people um, in a pastoral care kind of way um, and help them with faith matters, um, but then also bringing people together across the different faith traditions with an understanding that we all have enough in common that we can learn from one another, we can pray together, we can worship together, and it will work in a cohesive way. So that's what I try to do. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, and I think your marriage to a Muslim is a testament to the fact that you not only work in interfaith circles, but practice it in your daily life. How does your marriage add depth to your work? Yes, thank you. It definitely does. Uh, yes, my husband Samir and I have been together 12 years, uh, married almost 12 years now. And um, we raise our children um, as Ismaili Muslims, uh, but I also teach them how to meditate um, in our house, we have a little shrine in our room uh, the, with a statue of the Buddha and a wall hanging of the Buddha. So teaching uh, the kids mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation. Um, whenever we see any animal or any person in pain, the kids automatically will say, Omani Padme Hum, uh, which is the Buddhist prayer for compassion. Um, but also we have pictures of the Aga Khan in our house, the leader of the Ismaili Muslims. And uh, the kids go to um, Jamaat Khanna, the Ismaili mosque, with my husband on Fridays. And then they come with us um, to the Interfaith Church on Saturday mornings. And now, confusingly, now that I got a job doing interfaith programming at a church, which is where I am right now in my office, uh, they come with me to church on Sundays. 
but I'm doing interfaith programming here. So we're trying to get speakers from different faiths to be able to speak and connect with folks at the church. Uh, so yes, so definitely raising our kids together in this, in a certain way, religiously fluid kind of environment. Uh, but also if you ask them what faith they are, they'll say they're Muslim, uh, but they also know a bit about Buddhism. Um, and so yeah, figuring out how to navigate that. I like to joke when Samir and I first got together, we only had two arguments about religion. One was whether or not I cook bacon in the house. <laughs> Back before I was vegetarian. Um, and the second is where to put my shrine, since it does have a statue of the Buddha. And was it okay to have that in our room? Or should that be somewhere else? Um, but otherwise, we've really figured out how to do it. And kind of how to when to celebrate our holidays, which holidays to celebrate, how to talk to our kids about the afterlife. And it's been, I found it really beautiful uh, that it's not just something that I try to preach about on Sundays, uh, this like navigating and working together, but we've really had to compromise and figure things out, what works best for our family, what will make sense and be cohesive for the children. And uh, I really love that. I feel like that's required me to learn how to be respectful and intentional um, in a really direct way, uh, which is nice and not something theoretical. So I've enjoyed that. And I've certainly learned so much more about Islam uh, and about other faiths in this kind of life. So I feel very grateful. Yeah, you are in a fortunate position. I think it's beautiful when the personal and public life, when they're aligned, you know? I mean, in some places, there are no official interfaith forums. How do you think we can integrate interfaith in a society that is wary of the so-called other? Yes, thank you. I know that's the question, right? How do we do that? How do we kind of speak to people where they are? You know, I think um, that's something I try to do with my Buddhism is how do you meet people where they are and not try to make them just be like you or kind of tell them they're wrong for being the way they are and they have to be different. Um, but I think all of that is about starting where people are. So in our societies, even in societies that are more homogenous, um, there will be difference in those societies. So how can we just take time to start to get to know each other? Uh, so to reach out to those who are maybe a little different from us in, in however that makes sense to you, whether it's someone who's a different religion, uh, comes from a different country originally, um, has a different religious, uh, um, racial or ethnic background, uh, and really try to take the time to get to know each other so asking questions in like an open-hearted way not in a way where you're trying to show off your own knowledge or you're assuming you already are going to know the answer to this but you're asking you know just to um make them feel a certain way about you but to really kind of be present and try to listen and get to know the other person uh when you feel more comfortable and maybe invite them over for dinner try to develop friendships we can learn so much from our friends um, and just try to learn from them and know that we can learn from each other and not just trying to impose how we are and what we believe in ourselves onto them, but really being open, having that kind of hospitality. I think that's what we really need. And then if somehow you're in a place where you don't know folks who are different, but you'd like to learn more, uh, that is one blessing of the internet, I think, is it's so easy to find people, to find talks on YouTube by people from other backgrounds, uh, other religions, who can really speak into some of these questions you have, uh, following people online who are different than you. Uh, again, just trying to take in some other perspectives. I think that's so good for all of us mm -hmm. so that we don't think that who we are is the way to be. But how can we take in other perspectives and start to integrate them and come to a better understanding of other people? Well, that's beautiful because even with friends and I, I feel because, I mean, your path on this journey of life is through Buddhism. So everyone has parts, aspects of their tradition, which can guide interfaith. So what are key Buddhist principles which guide interfaith? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I think there are a few that work well. Um, one of the main ones I do is mindfulness. The idea of trying to be fully present when I'm with someone. So I once got asked to give a talk about the different things we do when we're with someone and we're not really listening. So, you know, when you're you're sitting with someone, but you're listening and you're thinking like, oh, that's not how that is actually. They're wrong. 
as soon as they stop talking, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. Or actually, you know what, that reminds me of this much better story that I have that I'm going to share now. Or, you know what, I need to, I, I need to turn this around. I don't like this kind of conversation. Let me like, go off and talk about something else or get them to talk about something else. And, but instead of doing that, like, how do we remain fully present with others? So this kind of mindfulness practice, this non-reactive, like just being with someone and being fully with them and being comfortable with them kind of leading the way, you know, when, um, when we lead our interfaith services and we take turns. So we're listening to folks from all these different backgrounds and, you know, folks will say things that are sometimes quite surprising to me or maybe a little uncomfortable for me. And how can I like stay with that rather than shutting down and trying to retake control? But how can I just remain present and listen to that and listen to the other person? So I think mindfulness, that's one of my favorite things. Like that's where I feel like my inner faith is actually how I practice Buddhism, uh, you know, is how do I listen compassionately and remain open uh, in a good way with other people. Also in Buddhism, um, I get asked this a lot because I work with a lot of folks who believe in God and they'll say, but Buddhism doesn't have God. So how does that work for you? Um, and Buddhism doesn't necessarily have God depending on which Buddhist you're talking to. Uh, but we do have something called dependent origination, which is the idea that nothing arises in and of itself separate from everything else. So the way that I am, I'm this way because of my family and my friends and the people around me and everything, all my interactions and all my connections have led to me being the way I am now. And the same is true for you and for everyone we meet. And so we're actually connected. So uh, it usually gets translated as emptiness uh, into English and people will hear that and they'll think that Buddhism is a very nihilistic tradition that doesn't believe in anything. And it's actually the opposite where it's we're empty of separation so there's no separation between us we're actually all connected so if you believe that then i'm not going to say well buddhism is the correct religion unlike these other ones or like i have the correct understanding of the universe unlike the rest of the people that doesn't make sense right because the whole idea is that we're all connected and so even if there isn't the same kind of idea as the um, of God is like the Abrahamic God. There's still this universal connection, which I, I learned a good seminary word, uh, panentheism. The idea of God as being like all the beings and all of life and the whole earth, and even more than that. And I feel like that really makes sense from a Buddhist perspective. It's like all of us are connected. Um, and I, yeah, that really speaks to me in an interfaith way. Um, and then finally, um, there's another concept in Buddhism uh, where the Buddhist said, you know, it's like I have like the Dharma is the raft. So there's, you know, the ocean around us or there's the river and we have the suffering that we're trying to escape. So we're on the raft. But the idea of the raft isn't to then become obsessed with the raft and cling to it. But the idea is to use the raft to get to the land or to get to the other shore. This kind of awakening, the spiritual awakening. So, but you don't go to get to the other shore so you can remain clinging to the raft. If you get there and then you try to bring the raft with you and you try walking around with a boat on your back and you're not going to get very far. But instead you have to let go of the raft. So you use the raft to get there and then you let go of it. Uh, so in the same way, he says, don't become obsessed with the Dharma. Don't become obsessed. Oh, you have to practice these exact teachings in this way. And this is exactly how it is. Because then you're not even trying to reach the shore. Then you just want to stay on the raft and tell everyone how great the raft is. So don't do that. Instead, be willing to let go. And that's and with the hope that all of us will get to the other shore together. So I hope that helps and makes some sense. Definitely. I like the concept of the togetherness and the connection and, and, and the oneness. You know, In fact, it ties to the final question I'm about to ask you. Um, it's it's a bit it sounds a bit non-dual when you were speaking about it that that oneness and uh, the panentheism about the non-duality and the oneness and I guess we've forgotten our interconnectedness and that can go a long way with interfaith depending on the faith traditions and also transcending at times 
which ties into the RACT policy, you know, um, just sometimes you just need to let the boat go and takes you to the to the other side. Um, so exactly. yeah, the final question, which is back again to the, the oneness, um, is what are ways in which we can open our hearts to embrace and, and recognizing that oneness that you so eloquently speak of? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what we need to do, right? How can we embrace the whole? Part of it is just letting go of ourselves, you know, not not being so focused on, well, this is this is who I am in the world. This is what the legacy I mean to leave. This is like these are my principles. Kind of not not letting go of that in a way that you're kind of free floating and not believing in anything. But how can you kind of let go of the ego? A bit. Be willing to look at your own shortcomings, uh, of which we all have so many. Start to be a bit more humble. Uh, listen more than you speak. Um, start to try to think about how you fit in in this kind of interconnected way, right? Rather than like, oh, well, I I'm in this position because I did these things, and look how great I am. But like, what? Who are all the people that led me to this? How can I thank them? How can I practice gratitude? How can I learn from others? When I see someone who really bothers me, what is it about them that bothers me? Maybe I have that as well. And maybe I should look at that. Uh, some of my own shortcomings, not to go in a negative way on the self, but to see that we all have our own shortcomings. We all have our own achievements and the good and bad we bring into the world. So instead of trying to uphold ourselves and our group, how can we kind of uphold others? and see our connection and how we're really the same in this way. Um, yeah, I, I worry with increasing polarization in the world, if we get so focused on saying, you know, my people are right and your people are not, and what's wrong with you all that you're this way. But instead, what can we, what can we learn from those who oppose us? What can we see that isn't the best about ourselves? And what can we see that's better about our opponents and try to come together in some kind of way in shared humanity so we don't have to be against one another. So yeah, I feel like I do see lots of people doing it. Certainly with the work you're doing, it's so beautiful and giving platforms to other people who are trying to do the same kind of good work in the world. I do see a lot of that and that gives me inspiration. So I hope we can learn from folks like that and come together in some kind of holistic way. So thank you so much for this. It's just so wonderful meeting you and I'm so grateful to be here. Thank I'm you. so grateful that you took time out of your schedule to be here. Um, like I said before, you're a source of inspiration and I hope one day you can make it over to Kuwait. And yes, and guide, uh, I'd love to guide us into- Our family would love to visit. <laughs> yeah. Be great. Thank you so much. Thank this you so much for your aura and your time. Oh, thank you.